Thank you, Fernando, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to come down to Brazil and to spend some time here. I um, have had a very nice time here doing research in Fernando's group. It's great to see so many familiar faces here in the, in the room. Um, and I'll just go ahead and get started. I wanted to make sure to put the students' names on this first slide and to remind myself to say thank you to those students. They're the ones that are still in Montana working in the lab um, generating results, and I'm the one that gets to go to Brazil and, and have fun and present the results. So I really appreciate their hard labor. Um, I thought I'd say a little bit about where I'm from. Obviously, I'm from the United States, and within the United States, I'm from Montana, and within Montana, I'm from Missoula, which is over here on the western edge of Montana. Um, Montana has, uh, is a fairly large state, uh, 380 square kilometers and has a population of just one million people. Um, that's about 2.7, 2.8 persons per square kilometer, which is about one-tenth of the population density of Brazil. Um, Montana is a beautiful place to live and to work. Uh, we have all four seasons, autumn. We have what most people would consider a very uh, severe winter. Um, many in the United States believe this is what Montana looks like about nine months out of the year, but it's typically only about four months out of the year. And um, lots of things to do outdoors, lots of uh, skiing and uh, activities on rivers and things like that. So it's a beautiful place to live. And I'll extend an invitation right now. Any of you who would like to come to Montana to please just let me know and we'll try to arrange some sort of a, a visit for you. In my lab, we are involved in two sort of very different areas of research. One is electrokinetic separations that I'll talk about today, but the other is environmental chemistry where we look primarily at particulate matter in the atmosphere, and we try to determine where that particulate matter, where that pollution came from. And in Montana, and also in Alaska where I've done a lot of this work, most of that um, pollution is coming from the use of wood stoves and wood heaters that people use in their homes. So just as a quick overview, um, it's very common in Montana to use a wood stove to heat your home outside of Missoula. It's not legal within the city limits of Missoula, but um, out in the countryside it's, it's used frequently and you can see that just one home produces quite a bit of smoke or particulate matter. And this will sit in valleys in areas where people are living and cause health problems and um, other issues. So what we are doing is collecting this particulate matter. We do a chemical analysis, and from the chemical analysis, we can tell you where the particulate matter came from. We can tell you whether it was from wood stoves or whether it was from one of these other potential sources. And because wood stoves are so prevalently, prevalently used in Montana, where I live, um, we find that most of the problem is from wood stoves, and so we've spent a lot of time characterizing the emissions of wood stoves. But what I want to talk about today is the other research area, which is the use of capillary electrophoresis and electrokinetic chromatography, and developing new materials to allow us to get better separations and wider applicability of these techniques, specifically electrokinetic chromatography. These are microscale separation methods, and the nice thing about that, of course, is there's low sample reagent and solvent consumption, so um, that's good for the environment, it's good for the bottom line. Um, they can be further miniaturized into chip-type devices, and I'm sure you folks have seen some of that type of research. Um, and uh, so this, these techniques are easily miniaturized into those types of devices. The applications that we're most interested in are in small molecules, pharmaceuticals, environmental compounds, uh, compounds of interest for, for forensic analysis. And what we've focused on the last several years is the development of new media, new materials to use to improve the performance of these separations and the fundamental characterization of those materials. So to give everybody just a little bit of a background and primer reminder of how this technique works, this is a basic capillary electrophoresis instrument, um, or a diagram of an instrument. Um, we have a high voltage power supply, which is capable of generating about 30 kilovolts of 
um, potential. And that power supply is connected to electrodes which are immersed in buffer vials at an inlet end and at the outlet end of a capillary. The capillary is made from fused silica, has a typically uh, typical inside diameter of about 50 micrometers, and it would typically be about 30 to 40 centimeters in length. To conduct this experiment, we fill the capillary with the buffer solution. We then remove the capillary from the buffer vial, place it in the sample vial, apply a pressure for a short period of time to introduce some sample into the capillary. We take the capillary back out of the sample vial, put it in the inlet vial, and then turn our power supply on. When we have high voltage applied, we have an electric field along the capillary, and our analytes that we're interested in, se in separating and analyzing will migrate from the inlet end toward the outlet end and past the detector where we'll detect them as they flow by. All of the separation takes place, of course, inside that capillary, and we're gonna focus on that as the talk goes on. I went the wrong direction. So one of the things that's happening inside this capillary that may not be immediately obvious is that when we apply the electrical potential, we get a bulk flow, a flow of the buffer solution from the inlet end toward the outlet end, from the anodic end toward the cathodic end of the capillary. And that flow is generated by um, the fact that the fused silica capillary has a permanent negative charge attached to the capillary, and that's balanced by loosely bound cations close to the wall. And when we apply the potential, those cations migrate along the capillary and they draw the solution through the capillary with them. And this type of flow is characterized by a flat flow profile, um, which means that all compounds inside this capillary will move at the same velocity from the anodic end toward the cathodic end of the capillary. So that's a flow mechanism. And then in addition to that, we have an electrophoretic mechanism that we use to actually separate the compounds. And so cations, neutral compounds, anionic compounds all experience that same electroosmotic flow and are all transported by that flow. But cations have, in addition to that, an electrophoretic mobility in the same direction. And so they have a total velocity or a total flow uh, movement which is the sum of these two velocities. Anions have electrophoretic mobility in the opposite direction, and so they have a total velocity which is the difference between their, the electroosmotic flow and the electrophoresis. Different cations have different rates of electrophoretic mobility, so they will be separated. Different anions can have different electrophoretic mobilities and they can be separated, but neutral compounds are all transported at the same velocity by the electroosmotic flow, and they are not separated unless we um, apply some technique to get a separation of those compounds. So in 1984, Professor Tarabe in Japan introduced this technique called electrokinetic chromatography, which is a modification of capillary electrophoresis that allows for the separation of those neutral compounds that would not otherwise be separated. And the basic idea here is he introduced what we call a pseudo-stationary phase into the capillary, into the buffer within the capillary. The pseudo-stationary phase that he used was micelles of sodium dodecyl sulfate. So they're negatively charged, they have a hydrophobic interior, and they are soluble and dispersed throughout the buffer medium in the capillary. Now, when we apply the potential, we still get electroosmotic flow through the capillary the same way we did before. This pseudo-stationary phase, because it's anionic, will have electrophoretic mobility in the opposite direction. And so it has a net or uh, effective velocity which is less than that of the electroosmotic flow. So we establish a situation where we have two phases. We have the buffer and then we have the pseudo-stationary phase which are migrating along this capillary at different velocities. Now if we have compounds that we're trying to separate, like solute one, solute two, and solute three, um, solute one is here to represent a compound that does not interact with the pseudo-stationary phase, does not interact with these SDS micelles. 
it would migrate at the velocity of the electroosmotic flow. Solute 3 is a very hydrophobic compound that is always associated with the SDS micelles. It would migrate at the velocity of the pseudostationary phase. And then other compounds which are partitioning back and forth between the pseudostationary phase and the background electrolyte, those compounds will migrate at intermediate velocities between that of the electroosmotic flow and of the pseudostationary phase. And so they will be separated depending on their affinity for the pseudostationary phase. So that's what makes this a chromatographic mechanism. It's based on equilibrium distribution between two phases. What makes it different from conventional chromatography is that the pseudostationary phase is not, in fact, stationary. It's moving through the capillary in the same direction as the flow. And so that causes some interesting differences between chromatography and electrokinetic chromatography. All right, if we do this technique properly and, and get a nice result like this, um, what we see is T0, which marks the migration time of an analyte or a compound that does not interact with the pseudostationary phase. So that compound, in this case, is acetone, has zero affinity for SDS micelles, and so it migrates with the electroosmotic flow and gives us an indication how long it takes the electroosmotic flow to come through the system. These compounds are being separated. They're, it's a homologous series of alkyl phenyl ketones. And so each of these compounds is one more methylene group, and so a little bit more hydrophobic than the last. And so they are separated based on their affinity for the SDS micelles. And then out here, around 14 minutes, is where we would expect to see a compound that is fully associated with the micelles and does not come out of the micelles at all. All of our separations need to be done within this window. So that's um, a significant difference between electrokinetic chromatography and conventional chromatography. We have this separation window to work with. Um, we can calculate retention factors just like we do with conventional chromatography, but now there's a new term in the equation which accounts for the migration time of the pseudostationary phase. And we can also predict what we would expect to get for the resolution between two compounds using, again, a very similar equation to what we use in conventional chromatography, but now with an additional term which accounts for the migration time of the pseudostationary phase. What we know about these, this homologous series is that each compound in the series, the selectivity between each compound in the series, the selectivity is the ratio of the retention factors. The selectivity is the same for each of these pairs. But as we get to later and later um, elution times, migration times, we see that the resolution is getting worse. And that's a, would, um, is shown in this equation, that as we, as our migration times become closer and closer to the retention time or the migration time of the pseudostationary phase, we'll start to lose resolution. This equation tells us that what we need to get good resolution is a large number of uh, theoretical plates or high efficiency, and electrokinetic chromatography affords us that. We generate typically a few hundred thousand theoretical plates using this technique, so that's very nice. We need to have good selectivity and we need to optimize our retention factor term. And this set of plots shows what the effect of retention factor is. Plotted on this axis is, are those last two uh, terms in the resolution equation, the retention factor terms. And then on this axis is the retention factor. The red line is what we see for conventional chromatography where we have a true stationary phase. So as we increase the retention factor, we see an a sharp increase initially in re resolution, and then it kind of levels off after that. With electrokinetic chromatography, we see that same sharp increase, but then we actually lose resolution as compounds are more retained. So the take home message from this, these, this set of plots is that, first of all, electrokinetic chromatography is always at a bit of a disadvantage in terms of this, these terms relative to conventional chromatography. So to overcome that and still achieve high resolution, we need to have high theoretical plate counts and good selectivity. And the other thing is that there is an optimal range for 
the retention factors. So we need to be able to adjust the conditions of the separation in order to optimize the retention factor to get the best possible resolution. And all of that leads to considerations for how you would develop a pseudo-stationary phase to give the best possible performance and the best possible separations in electrokinetic chromatography. So we're concerned about the aggregation properties. If we're gonna use micelles like sodium to decil sulfate micelles, then we have to be concerned about the concentration at which they aggregate because if we have a lot of excess surfactant in solution, we have a lot more current and a lot more current leads to lower efficiency. We have to be worried about the temperature at which they form and we also have to be worried about their stability. Um, I'll come back to that. They need to be soluble and ionic. We wanna have high electrophoretic mobility for our pseudo stationary phase so that we get a, a wide migration range. We want the separation efficiency to be as high as possible, which means minimizing the current and making sure that we have fast mass transfer and also a relatively monodisperse pseudostationary phase. And we have to be concerned about the ability of the pseudostationary phase to solvate our analytes. We want high separation selectivity, pure materials, and we have to worry about the the extent to which the pseudo-stationary phase will interfere with detection. Because unlike conventional chromatography, in this technique, the pseudo-stationary phase migrates right through the detector. So we have to be concerned about the effect it will have on the signal from the detector. It turns out, while SDS micelles were the first pseudo-stationary phase to be used by Tarabe um, 30 years ago, they remain one of the most popular pseudostationary phases because they meet most of these criteria. But there are certain areas where SDS micelles have some weaknesses. One is in this area of joule heating. The SDS, when added to solution at a high enough concentration to get the separation to work, carries a lot of current, causes a lot of joule heating. And so um, Joe Davis, has published a series of papers in which he has demonstrated that it is this joule heating effect with SDS micelles that limits the efficiency of the separations in electrokinetic chromatography. Separation selectivity is not a problem with SDS, but SDS provides only one separation selectivity. So it would be like trying to do gas chromatography and having only one stationary phase, or doing liquid chromatography and having only one stationary phase. So it's nice to have different stationary phases to give us different selectivity. SDS works really well with UV detection, but it is not compatible with mass spec detection. And mass spec detection is really important, of course, for uh, pharmaceutical analysis and also for forensic analysis. And then finally, the stability of the micelles is a, a bit of an issue. When we start adjusting the conditions, suppose we add organic solvents to adjust the, the separation conditions, then the thermodynamics of uh, micelle formation change, the structure of the micelles changes, and even the stability existence of the micelles can be in doubt. So um, that's been a, always been a problem with SDS micelles. So we've been looking at ways to develop new materials which will overcome some of these limitations and provide additional separation selectivity. And we have focused on polymeric materials as the materials to use for pseudo-stationary phases. We have found that they are particularly useful for the separation of hydrophobic compounds because we can add organic solvents and optimize that retention factor. Um, we found that they often give us unique selectivity um, because we can vary the structure of the polymer without worrying about its aggregation properties, whether or not it will form micelles. We have not yet demonstrated this, but others have taken materials very similar to what we have developed and introduced chiral selectivity into the po polymers. Um, they are useful with mass spec detection. We've looked at a variety of different types of polymers and we're now working on polymeric nanoparticles, which is what I'll spend most of the time, rest of the time talking about. The first materials we, we looked at were these so-called poly soaps. And, Really all they are are a surfactant that has a polymerizable group on the end of the hydrophobic tail. So once they form micelles, you can polymerize them in the structure of micelles 
and then isolate them as these polymeric micelle structures. They have, of course, very high um, stability then. We can use very high concentrations of organic solvents and get very nice separations of hydrophobic compounds. They generate less current, so that in principle we ought to be able to do faster separations and higher separations with higher efficiency. We showed that they provide unique selectivity and also that they are, in fact, compatible with mass spectrometric detection. The limitation with those materials, though, is that just like SDS micelles, we need to have some sort of a surfactant which will aggregate in solution, and so that limits the range of structures we can study. So we introduced a series of polymers that have um, ionic groups on the polymer, but then also have sites where we can introduce different chemistry to, to afford us different separation selectivity. Um, these polymers work very well as well, and we can, in fact, by changing the functional group on the polymer, we can change the selectivity of the separations. So it works out well. The limitation with these is that they're all statistical copolymers. So what that means is that we have very little control over the structure of the polymer. We know what the average ratio of ionic to non-ionic is, but we can't really control where the ionic groups are versus the non-ionic. And we also know that we have mixtures of polymers that have different ratios. So it's difficult to get really nice, clean, uh, monodisperse system from this type of chemistry. So what we're working on now is the use of latex nanoparticles as a pseudostationary phase or as pseudostationary phases. And we form these latex nanoparticles. They are actually aggregates of AB block copolymers where we have a high, uh, the aggregate looks something like this. This is just a cartoon, of course. And we have, in the core, a hydrophobic uh, block of a copolymer. And around the shell, we have a hydrophilic ionic block for the copolymer. And we've been synthesizing these, it says 10 to 60 nanometers. But I will show you some results today where we've synthesized some that are as high as 100 or 120 nanometers. What we like about this is that we can separately synthesize the ionic A block, shown in red here, and the non-ionic hydrophobic B block, almost visible in blue here. And we can change the chemistry, we can change the size of both blocks independently so that we can really have a large amount of control over the structure of the nanoparticles. All right. As we develop these nanoparticles, we're interested in the type of separation selectivity that they will afford us. And one way that we use to characterize that is this so-called linear solvation energy relationship model. The basic idea here is that if we measure that retention factor and we take the logarithm of the retention factor, that's proportional to the standard state free energy change when we go from the background electrolyte into the pseudostationary phase. So as an analyte, as a molecule um, is transferred from the background electrolyte to the pseudostationary phase, there's a change in the standard state free energy, and this is proportional to that change. And then the idea is that that change in free energy is due to the sum of different types of chemical interactions that might be taking place. So this is a volume turn. It's the volume of the analyte, the specific molar volume of the analyte, and it speaks to the types of dispersive interactions you might expect to have. This is a polarity term. This is an acidity term, a basicity term, and then this is a polarizability term. It's the excess molar refraction of the solute. So the way we apply this technique is we measure the retention factor and calculate the logarithm of the retention factor for 30 to 40 different compounds for which we know the values of capital V, capital S, A, B, and E. We know those values, they're tabulated, they're published. And then, once we have the retention factors, we can use least squares linear regression to fit the retention factor values to this equation. And from that, we obtain the small V, S, A, B, and E. And those tell us about the relative strength of interactions of the solute with the pseudostationary phase versus the background electrolyte. 
it's a lot on this slide, but the take home message is that by looking at patterns in these values and comparing one pseudo-stationary phase to another, we can get an idea about the differences in chemical interactions and the differences in chemical selectivity for the different materials. We've done this for a lot of different pseudo-stationary phases. I'm just showing a few results here. This is one of our latex nanoparticles that I'll talk more about in a few minutes. This is a copolymer, a statistical or random copolymer of dodecyl methacrylate and acrylamidomethyl propane sulfonic acid. The green is SDS micelles and the uh, purple is one of those polymeric surfactants, one of those poly soaps. What we're seeing is that V and B are the most important terms in determining the retention in these systems. Um, v is that dispersivity term and B is the basicity of the solute. We're also seeing that we can generate pseudo-stationary phases that are less cohesive or more cohesive than SDS. And we can generate um, pseudo-stationary phases that are more, more able to interact with basic compounds and less able to interact with basic compounds than SDS. The take home message is we can get an idea what's going on in these systems and we can synthesize different types of polymeric materials with very different chemical interactions and very different chemical selectivity from the conventional SDS micelles. All right, so currently what we're working on is the use of um, reversible additional fragmentation transfer polymerization, a controlled polymerization technique so that we can control the size and structure of our polymers to generate nanoparticles that we can use as pseudo-stationary phases. And um, we're characterizing their applicability in electrokinetic chromatography, looking at performance, looking at um, effects of changes to the chemistry of the nanoparticles, and also confirming that we can use both UV and mass spec detection. So, the, tr the real big trick to this uh, chemistry is the use of this controlled living polymerization technique. It's called raft polymerization. Again, reversible addition fragmentation transfer. And it's a free radical polymerization technique. It is, um, what's nice about it is that we can really control the size and the chemistry of our polymers much more carefully than we can with conventional free radical polymerization. So in conventional free radical polymerization, we have monomers and we add an initiator, we initiate the reaction, and it runs pretty much at random and very rapidly. We generate polymers, adding another monomer in a, in a rapid free radical reaction. And that reaction is terminated when two of those growing polymer chains find each other and terminate the reaction to form a dead polymer. Um, there's nothing wrong with that technique, of course, except that we typically will generate very polydispersed polymers because the rate of propagation, because of the different times of initiation, and because it's a random process when these polymers find each other to terminate, we get very broad distributions in molecular weight. So what we're using instead is this controlled technique where we use a chain transfer agent, and this chain transfer agent has a functional group which stabilizes free radicals and also a free radical leaving group on it. So once we initiate the polymerization, one of those growing polymer chains will find the chain transfer agent, react with it to form this intermediate which is stable and unreactive. Um, the concentration of this chain transfer agent is higher than the concentration, much higher than the concentration of the initiator so most of the polymer, once it's initiated, is gonna end up in this form. It can then uh, release that leaving group, which is a free radical. That leaving group, which is released, can initiate additional polymerization. The amount, the number of these polymer growing chains here, these chains initiated by this leaving group, is equal to or less than the concentration of the, the original concentration of the um, chain transfer agent. 
we use a very low concentration of initiator and a relatively high concentration of the, initi of the tr chain transfer agent. So most of our polymers are in this form, initiated by the R group and capped on the end by this chain transfer agent. Once this process occurs, then we allow this reaction to run. Polymerization occurs relatively slowly because the concentration of these growing polymer chains is quite low. We have most of our polymer in this form or this form and very little in the form of active free radicals that are growing. So the polymerization occurs slowly. This is an equilibration process which leads to all of the polymers having similar chain lengths so we don't end up with a broad dispersity in our polymer chain lengths. And because the concentrations of these free radicals growing chains is quite low, the chances of seeing this sort of a termination reaction are quite low as well. So we don't expect to see very much dead polymer formed by this mechanism. When we stop the reaction, we expect to have mostly this structure of polymer with the chain transfer agent attached to the end of the growing chain. It's still a living polymer at that point. We can stop a polymerization, we can purify this material, and then we can start a second polymerization using this material as our chain transfer agent. So the way that we apply that to the synthesis of our nanoparticles, we start with a chain transfer agent with the leaving group and the stabilizing group. We have a hydrophilic monomer. We do the synthesis in aqueous solution. Um, and we initiate and allow a hydrophilic block to grow under controlled conditions. And so as an example, this is the chain transfer agent that we're using. It has an ionic leaving group and a hydrophobic um, stabilizing group. Once the polymer forms, then we have a hydrophilic end with ionic groups at one end. We're using, in this case, as an example, uh, acrylic acid as our hydrophilic monomer. And then we have it capped on the end by this uh, chain transfer group. So this is a macro chain transfer agent. We can get that out of solution, we can purify it, we can characterize it, and then we can put it back into aqueous solution and start another polymerization using a hydrophobic monomer. So that gives us our hydrophilic block and then we start attaching a hydrophobic block to the polymer. So we have an amphiphilic polymer with a hydrophobic end and a hydrophilic end, they will start to aggregate into aggregates in solution. And as we continue the polymerization, the further hydrophobic monomer will polymerize within the core of that nanoparticle and it really stabilizes the nanoparticle so that it doesn't, uh, is no longer just an equilibrium aggregate, but it's a stable structure. We've done this with a lot of different chemistries now. We started off with acrylic acid as the shell chemistry and butyl acrylate as the core chemistry. We've moved on to AMPS or acrylamido methyl propane sulfonic acid as the ionic monomer and we have now methyl, ethyl and butyl um, acrylates as the core for the nanoparticles. The student who's working on all this, Jesse, um, he's come up with these uh, interesting acronyms for each of these structures. So this is butyl acrylate, acrylic acid. This is ethyl acrylate, AMPS, butyl acrylate, AMPS, um, nanoparticles. As I said, once we start the polymerization, we can stop it. We can collect that ionic uh, oligomer and characterize it. And here we've done electrospray ionization mass spec. And what we're showing is that we have um, polymers in the range of one out to 10 monomer units with an average of about 5.3. Our goal here was to have five monomer units, so it's pretty nice that we can achieve something close to the goal. There is some dispersity, obviously. The longer you allow these chains to get in um, controlled polymerization, the less dispersity, polydispersity you get. But since we want these short chains, we're gonna have to deal with a certain amount of polydispersity in the chain lengths. After we then go on and do the second step and polymerize the hydrophobic uh, block and form the nanoparticles, what we can do then is 
characterize them by light scattering, and we can see this nanoparticle has an uh, average diameter of 63 nanometers, plus or minus 26%. That's relatively monodispersed for this type of uh, system. It's, obviously, there's some dispersity here, but these are rather monodispersed systems in the end. So having synthesized those nanoparticles, we can do the separation of those alkyl phenyl ketones. This is using the butyl acrylate acrylic acid nanoparticle at only 0.12% in solution. Um, we're seeing acetone and then five of these ketones separated in about less than five minutes. Uh, we get very high efficiency, very nice high plate counts for these peaks. We do see some odd shaped peaks in the center of the separation that we still don't really understand what's causing that. Um, and we're able to use UV detection. In spite of the fact that these are nanoparticles and they scatter light, we can still use UV detection and not have to worry too much about the interference from the nanoparticles. We've characterized them in a lot of different ways. One thing that we did was to look at retention or the logarithm of the retention factor as a function of the concentration of acetonitrile added to the system. And these are for those same five alkyl phenyl ketones. And we see these nice linear relationships here. The, the nice thing about that is it allows us to predict what to expect in terms of retention as we change the organic modifier concentration. But the other thing that this tells us is that these nanoparticles are stable in these organic modified buffers. If they were falling apart, we would see some dramatic change in retention at some point. So the performance characterization, characteristics, uh, almost no current is carried by these nanoparticles. I'll show you what the um, outcome or what, the, what that means for us in just a second. Uh, we do see some increased noise in UV detection, and you can see that here. This is without nanoparticles, this is with nanoparticles. So there is a substantial increase in the noise, but still we're able to get uh, reasonable detection. And we did I observe this odd trend where you see some of those peaks are fronting a little bit, but we still don't really understand. Why is it important that the nanoparticles do not conduct any current? Well, here what we're doing is in a relatively short capillary with very high field strength and still very low current, most of this current is carried by the borate buffer and not by the nanoparticles. We're able to separate those same five ketones in less than 20 seconds. So we can do very fast separations, still with very high efficiency, somewhere around 40,000 theoretical plates for these separations. If we carry this research on and we look at butyl acrylate AMPS copolymers versus ethyl acrylate AMPS copolymers, this is a separation um, that was achieved by Jesse Hislop, my student, who um, took 22 different substituted benzene and naphthalene compounds and separated them in less than four minutes using each of these two different nanoparticles as the pseudostationary phase. In general, we see very high efficiency. We do see a little bit of tailing sometimes, a little bit of fronting sometimes. We, again, don't fully understand what's causing that. Um, the other thing that we can see is these, are, these 22 compounds are numbered in the order of elution on the butyl acrylate nanoparticle. And if we compare that order on the ethyl acrylate, we can see some significant differences in the position and the relative migration times of these peaks. So that tells us that the ethyl acrylate core gives us quite different selectivity from the butyl acrylate core. And in fact, if we apply our linear solvation energy relationship model to this, these materials, looking at butyl acrylate, ethyl acrylate, and methyl acrylate polymers, all with the same um, AMPS shell, and with different sizes from 139 nanometers, and then 17, 115, 12, and then 17, what we see is actually some trend in these results. So going from larger nanoparticles towards smaller nanoparticles and going from longer alkyl chains towards shorter alkyl chains, we see that the nanoparticles become more cohesive, less able to solvate large molecules. We also see that these compounds become more able to interact with basic compounds, more able to interact with acidic compounds, and more able to interact with polar compounds. So we see some trends in the results. 
We can, by changing the structure of the nanoparticles, we can change the selectivity of the separations, and we can understand a little bit why that selectivity is changing, and it changes in ways that make really good sense chemically, as it turns out. The yellow bar here is for SDS, so again, the phase that we compare everything to, and we can see that we go from materials that are less cohesive to materials that are similarly or a little bit more cohesive. Um, we, again, in other areas we have different um, interaction strengths, and so we can expect very different selectivity from SDS micelles. Can we use these with mass spec detection? Yes, we can. This is um, EKC mass spec using electrospray ionization. We had 0.12% um, nanoparticle. This is a butyl acrylate acrylic acid nanoparticle in the background electrolyte. And we're separating four different um, common pharmaceutical compounds and detecting them by mass spectrometry. We're using a total ion chromatogram here between the range of 240 and 270, which is wide enough for these four compounds. If we look at any one of these compounds, in this case we've looked at the alpranolol, we can get a nice mass spectrum for that compound and identify that compound. So this works quite well, and in fact we ran these experiments for uh, several weeks um, continuously without any problems clogging up the um, interface on the mass spectrometer. So the very low concentration of these nanoparticles combined with their very high molecular weight um, means that they don't interfere with the mass spec uh, analysis in any way. And in fact, if we look at the extent to which we see any kind of ion suppression, so what you're worried about when you add an additive like this is that it will suppress ionization of your analytes. So what we're looking at here is the signal from the mass spectrometer without nanoparticles and then with nanoparticles for salbutamol, diphenhydramine, nortriptylin, alpranolol, diethyl phthalate, and dipropyl phthalate. When we look at these results, we see a couple of cases where we do see significant loss, statistically significant loss in the signal. But in most cases, we see no significant change in the uh, amount of signal that we achieve. And so, um, in general, these nanoparticles work quite well for mass spec detection. Right now, what we're working on is um, development of cationic nanoparticles. These are synthesized by exactly the same method, exactly the same approach as the anionic nanoparticles, but we're using a cationic monomer for our hydrophilic monomer. The reason we did this is we wanted the nanoparticles to adsorb to the capillary walls. When they adsorb to the capillary walls, they'll take those negative anionic, the negative charge on the wall, convert it to positive charge, and that in turn reverses the electroosmotic flow. And we wanted reversed electroosmotic flow for the, this particular application. So we've synthesized these cationic nanoparticles. They do, in fact, adsorb to the capillary walls. Everything looked like it was working very nicely until we tried to do some separations, and you see very poor peak shapes, very long retention times for compounds just because they're interacting with the nanoparticles that are adsorbed to the capillary walls. So um, we can't just use the nanoparticles to um, adsorb to the walls and um, reverse the electroosmotic flow. We need to find some other way to do that because if we do this, we end up with very poor separation efficiency. So Julie McGetrick, the other student who was on the title slide, has worked this out now. And what she has done is to synthesize just the cationic polymer. She's done it by the controlled polymerization mechanism. So she has this nice um, uniform cationic polymer. And she can use that to modify the capillary walls. So she first treats the capillary with this cationic polymer. That reverses the charge on the walls of the capillary. And then when she introduces the nanoparticles, they don't adsorb to the walls because they're repelled by that cationic charge. And then she can achieve very nice high efficiency separations. These are six of those same alkyl phenyl ketones. Um, very high efficiency, very nice selectivity, uh, six minute um, analysis time here. So everything seems to be working quite well for this particular separation now. 
and the cationic nanoparticles seem to give us very nice results. The application that she's working on is a simultaneous analysis of anionic and nitroaromatic um, compounds that are found in explosives and in explosive residues. So the idea here is to use a single capillary or a single channel to, to achieve the separation of both the anionic compounds and the um, aromatic compounds. And so this is very early in this process. She just generated these, these data last week. But basically, here she has the separation of the anionic compounds, and they are separating purely by electrophoresis. They're not interacting with the nanoparticles. They're just separating by electrophoresis. And then these compounds here uh, are all being separated by interaction with the nanoparticles, with the cationic nanoparticles that she's developed. Um, it takes about six minutes right now. We need to, to um, make the people who are funding this work happy. We need to get that down to two or three minutes. I think we can do that. Um, we're using UV detection right now. That's not ultimately what we'll do. We'll have two different detectors. One detector will be an, a conductivity detector so that we can determine the ionic compounds. And the other detector will be a fluorescence quenching device where the um, ability of these nitroaromatic compounds to quench fluorescence will be used to detect them. So we think we're making some pretty good progress now in this um, simultaneous separation. Okay, so to finish up, we're pretty excited about these raft-generated nanoparticles as pseudostationary phases for electrokinetic chromatography. We've demonstrated that they're compatible with both UV and mass spec detection. We've demonstrated that they're compatible with a lot of different types of buffers, including buffers um, modified with acetonitrile. We have very um, strict control over the structure and the, the structure and the chemistry of these nanoparticles. So we have very strict control over the structure and chemistry, and that allows us to change the selectivity and to alter the selectivity as we like. Um, and we found, up until now at least, that the primary selectivity difference is a function of the core chemistry and not so much the chemistry of the ionic shell. Uh, we know we can form highly st stable suspensions. These compounds or these nanoparticles do not precipitate, precipitate out of solution. And very significantly, we do not observe any current when we add the nano, adi additional current, when we add the nanoparticles to the system. So what that means is that we can do very fast separations. And as I mentioned, the people who are funding that research on the nitroaromatic compounds would like to see our separation down two or three minutes. We think we can get there because we can do it by increasing the electric field strength and reducing the um, length of the capillary. So I'll leave you with that and a few pictures, a few more pictures of Montana and ask if there are any questions.